Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Well, as you can see, uh, I'm the guy in the middle with the business sign behind me and uh, have two good looking guys either side of me today. who are going to take us through something that is very innovative. Uh, Jaco Gerbo uh, is with Futureneers, Albertus Marais is uh, a tax expert. Yaka, you told me that Albertus is like the the best uh, tax expert in South Africa. I hope you were exaggerating, just to, just for effect. Uh, by far the best one I've worked with. <laughs> <laughs> and you're you're a chartered accountant, so you know these things very well. Albertus, and, uh, just, just to... he's not cheap, so that means he's got to add a lot of value. So <laughs> okay, quick. So and and also we cannot overrun our time today either, uh, as a consequence of that. Albert, it's lovely to have you. Just uh, just to bring everybody, our whole community, into the picture. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and what you keep doing every day? Oh, so I mean, we're a, a tax consultancy practice in Cape Town. Um, we're about five years old. Uh, about 15 people concentrating on, well, not concentrating, doing exclusively tax consulting work. In other words, to assist in, in tax planning and tax structuring to ensure that clients on a conservative and responsible basis uh, structure their affairs as tax efficiently as possible. And then, of course, we also engage in, in tax disputes where clients are um, in an unfortunate position enough to be engaged themselves in that manner. I must say, though, quite often it's not my clients that are engaged in disputes it's other clients being engaged in disputes and they then end up being clients of ourselves thereafter uh, okay so you step in and you rescue them from uh punery uh, in in yako's case so what i'm fascinated about here is that 12j has been around since 2009 and nobody uh, to my knowledge has made the the creative thought that you have where you can actually uh, create a tax base or a, 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 an assessed loss, which can then be used over many years. So the 12J, Yako is supposed to end now at the 30th of June, but by implementing things a little differently, and Albertus is gonna tell us exactly how it all works, uh, you could actually be writing back against your tax for years into the future. Um, yes, I like. I think it's important to understand um, when, when we develop our products, we always listen to our clients and the market. And if you look at what happened the last few years, um, 12J, like you said, it, it was in place since 2009, but the real adoption only took place the last few years. So what the market is telling you is people want to invest in 12J. People are um, repeat investors. They've invested last year, they're investing now. And, and if it weren't for the deadline coming up, they would probably have invested again next year. So the adoption rate is there, they, they're starting to understand the product. So it makes perfect sense to, to develop a product that can enable people um, to almost invest in a product that enables them to, to get a bit extra this year before the deadline comes into play. Right, and so it is. Okay, so I'm gonna take myself off the screen and leave it to you gentlemen to start talking us through the various slides. We've got a few, it is interactive. So before we get cracking on here, just to remind everybody, uh, those who are attending today, that you can pose your questions. If you have a look at your control panel on your screen, there's a little question mark. And in that question mark, if you click it, you can type in your question. And uh, as soon as they come through, I will pose them to Yako and Albertus. Uh, starting off though, Yako, do you want to just take us through this slide, which tells us a bit about uh, the, the company uh, KSE that we've um, featured now in the past couple of months and uh, are going to be taking, uh, going into some depth today in this webinar? Yes, Alec, um, I think it's important to understand that the product and the finance solution we're going to present today, it, it's interlinked to your investment in the KSE Solar Fund. So very important to understand that. 
Um, on a previous webinar, we did go into detail on explaining who the team is and their credentials. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through this one quite quickly. But I think if you can look on, on the screen, um, you'll see that there's a good balance in that team between operational experience. On the left-hand side, you've got all the engineers and on the right-hand side, probably the accountants. So uh, if you look at the solar, solar space, that's what you need. Um, you need to build a power plant. So you need, you need a lot of engineering um, experience and, and knowledge to actually design these power plants. It's not as simple as just throwing a few solar panels on a roof. Um, the market that we are playing in is commercial and industrial. There's a lot of design work involved. So Anton Bosov is the ex-CEO of Big in Africa, um, a, big, a big company that um, Anton has overseen infrastructure development projects to the extent of 30 billion over the last few years. Ricky Heiser is the CEO of AEC. AEC is a key player that partnered with, with um, KSE as one of the preferred suppliers and, and um, developers of solar projects for, for Standard Bank. They also developed some models for, for Investec. Teresa is involved on, on the feasibility studies. Rulani has also got a, a huge background in renewable energies and obviously myself um, from the finance perspective. Um, important to understand that, that the team are very operational. We're all involved in the business and we look after the investment. Um, um, our money is also next to that of, of the investors. So very important. Um, it's our business. We, we live it. We breathe it. Um, we're involved in the business on a daily basis. I'm very pleased that you went through the team because we have uh, the bulk of the people who are uh, on the webinar today were not people who came to the last one on KSE. So it, uh, you know, we always assume that, oh, well, everyone's heard this, so let's not repeat it. Uh, it isn't a, we've got a, a whole lot of fr fresh people. You must have done very well in the last webinar with Jackie. So I've got a high barrier to, to uh, meet too, because it seems like you explained things very well in that uh, discussion. But let's move on to the next slide now. And this is really where we start getting into the meat and potatoes of exactly how the investment in KSE works. Just by way of background, by now, I think everybody who's attending this understands that 12J is a tax incentive program, that whatever you invest in 12J has to stay there for at least five years, but that you can write off the investment against your taxable income this year. Uh, tax year. So in other words, you put your money in before the 30th of June when the uh, Treasury says it all ends and you can in this tax year write it back. Of course, what you're going to be telling us about now is how you can create a, uh, a an assessed loss which can take you into writing back tax into the future. But just take us through this one again, Yako, I think uh, pretty briefly because it, it is quite self-explanatory. Sure. Um, I think it's important to understand most investors don't actually realize that when they, when they invest in a 12J, they don't invest directly in a specific project. So that the way it works is the shares that will be issued by the 12J, in this case, Future News Capital. So the investor will subscribe for a specific share in Future News Capital. We as a VCC will then subscribe for shares in the operating company, in this case, Key Solar Exchange. Important VCC? to know that... What VCC is VCC? Stands, it stands for Venture Capital Company, and it's a term used by the Income Tax Act to describe any 12J company. So these are registered companies with SARS that are, that are registered to, to enable investors to invest and get the tax deduction. Good. Okay. Um, the, on the operating side, it's very important to understand um, where your assets are sitting and what you effectively invest in. So let's, let's just simplify it. From an investor's perspective, you will hold an indirect asset through Futures Capital in KSE. Um, KSE will then acquire, fund, and build these solar, these solar plants, enter into certain agreements with clients, and then sell energy um, like, like similar, on a similar manner like ESCOM to various clients. What makes the KSE model um, slightly different from what's out there in the market is what we call our multi-tenanted approach. And what I mean by that is simply that we would normally go into a transaction where we would, we would enter into an agreement with the owner of a, um, a business park, a corporate park, um, as well as the body corporate. In this case, we'll, we'll sign a 20-year power purchase agreement and power supply agreement with the body corporate. And the body corporate, in turn, will then supply energy to various tenants in that specific body corporate. Um, the benefit of this model is by signing one agreement, you're actually supplying energy to 10, 15, 20 um, potential different clients, and you spread your, your collection risk and your future credit risk to those different clients. Because if you break it down, it's a very simple approach. 
you actually um, fund the plant, you design it, and then you sell energy to these tenants. Um, okay. What's also the, important... The, sorry, the tenants being commercial and industrial, they, what do you mean by that? Are these uh, retail operations or uh, factories? Um, Alec, if you can just go to the next slide, that's probably going to explain it the best. Um, it's not the glamorous buildings in the middle of, of Santon. These are industrial sites. Some of them probably in the middle of nowhere, just off, off the highway normally. And it's big factories. Um, it's tenants that use a lot of energy, like um, they use fridges or they build certain things where there's a lot of heat required. Um, in this case, if you look at the picture, this is a picture of one of our first projects, which is Sunland Ridge. It's a business park just outside of Centurion on your way to, Kru to Krugersdorp. And what's very unique to this model is um, the picture's a bit small, but if you can see there's, there's probably about 12 units in this whole body corporate. And the way that it has been structured is there in the middle, you'll see a unit five and a unit 10. So we will be installing solar panels on the roofs of unit five and unit 10. And then we'll be running almost like a mini grid, but not a grid into ESCOM, a mini grid where all the solar energy that will be generated by those two units will go into the grid. And the grid would then distribute that energy to the 10 buildings in this business park. And, the, and, and those buildings will actually acquire um, the energy from us. Again, the benefit of that model is you spread your risk. The investor is actually owning solar on two roofs, but the, your credit risk is spread through 10 users. Um, what's also unique is even if building 10 is standing empty, the solar on that roof still produces energy. It puts it into the mini grid and you can still sell that solar to another user. So when you scale the project correctly, and we normally use a factor of between 40 and 50%, so normally we wouldn't generate more than 40 or 50% of the total energy uh, required by the total of, of the 10 buildings. So that, that basically means that before we, we start losing income from, from bad debts or not, not collecting any, any energy, um, is when about 40 or 50% from the park is actually empty, not only one building. Okay. Uh, now we can, I think, bring in our expensive guest. I think it's time for him to start working for his money. Oh, there we go. I'm very impressed, Albertus. Um, do you want to just uh, introduce uh, the the whole concept? I, I'm not sure I did it. I did it as as uh, well. I know I didn't do it as well as, well as you can, Yaka. And then we'll let Albertus actually take us through the next few slides. Yeah, Alec, I haven't explained um, the whole funding model in detail to Albertus. Um, obviously, we consult with him specifically on, on the carrying forward of assessed losses and so forth. So maybe let me, let me just bat for him up there. So a key and an essential part of our funding model is the ability to create a tax loss and then to carry forward that tax loss into the future. And that applies for companies as well as individuals. And, and I think if Albertus can maybe just elaborate on that, um, that would be very so, useful for, for the viewers or for the listeners. So, Alec, you said at the beginning that um, it's a it's a concept that we came up with at, at AJM and uh, the firm, and it's 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 really not the case. I mean, I wish we could take credit for that, but it's really, I believe, a rather uncontroversial principle. What happens with any taxpayer um, making a loss in any year for tax purposes? Is that loss is carried forward by virtue of uh, section 20 of the Income Tax Act year on year and really the the only requirement is that the taxpayer should be trading in doing so. Now, immediately I know that a number of uh, potential investors in this fund will say well I don't have a business of my own, I'm not consulting, I'm not a partner in a professional firm or anything of that sort and then that's not prohibitive. Uh, trading is, a, is an extremely wide concept for tax purposes. In fact it's specifically defined as including any venture or occupation or anything of this sort. And it specifically includes any employment engaged in. So if a salaried individual makes an investment in a Section 12J company, in a VCC, in excess of what his or her remuneration for that year would be, they would be A, trading, and secondly, have an assessed loss, meaning that on that basis alone, they qualify to carry forward that loss to be set off against next year's taxable income. Okay, there is a question before we go into more detail. It comes from Renell, um, who asks, how do you counter the theft risk? Who carries the cost and responsibility of security, insurance, etc.? Uh, there's a definite increase in thefts targeting solar infrastructure. So it's nothing to do with the tax, but Yaka, I think it's obviously burning on Renell. Uh, 
Could, would you be able to give us your response to that? Ronel, um, we do it the best we can. The first important point is it's all roof mounted. So the solar um, panels are situated, if you go back to that picture, um, on, the, on the roofs of the buildings. So it's difficult to, to access. There's also security around the different buildings. And then finally, we take our insurance on all the panels as well. So part of our costing model is a fully insured model um, where, where the solar panels are insured. Um, your real loss is loss of income for a while. So if cables are stolen and so forth, there's, there's a period of time which you need to send in the team that could have fixed it. And, and that's the real risk. Um, so the replacement risk is addressed through insurance and management of the premises. But your, your loss of income, that, that is a potential risk. But like I said, we, we, we do factor in potential risks like that in our models. Brilliant. All right, let's get back to the uh, presentation now and maybe we can talk to this slide. Okay, so once we've, okay, so maybe I'll, I must go a step back, um, Alec. Um, when we started listening to our clients and, and it's the old story, um, we, we talked to them and the, the need out there, like I said, that they, at the um, beginning of the presentation is we've got clients that's investing not only for a first time, but a second time, and they want to invest for a third time. The major stumbling block is at this stage now, there's two major limitations in the market. There's, a, there's an upcoming deadline, which is a statutory imposed deadline of the end of June. That effectively means that any investment before the 30th of June is still 100% deductible um, as a 12J investment. We as a VCC will give you a share certificate for that investment, but any, any share capital raised by us or any other registered section 12J VCC after the dead deadline, we can't give a tax certificate to investors anymore. We can still continue raising capital, but we can't give you a, a tax break on that capital that you're contributing to the companies. So that's the first important thing to understand. So um, when we started speaking to people, we, we, we initially started on, on a company model where we went back to companies and it was widely accepted in the market that normally a company, it's simple for a company to create a tax loss and carry it forward because there's that widely accepted um, assumption out there that if you're a company and you trade and there's a tax loss, um, pending certain rules from SARS aside, you can carry it forward. Um, that's, that's how the model started and, and this model works really, really, really well for a company as well because the company's got an annual limit of 5 million. So a company can actually make a, an investment before the end of June of 5 million and actually get a tax deduction for that 5 million. But that's how the thought process started and then we, we actually started expanding into individuals. And if you think back, um, the last few years, all the fund managers advised their clients if they're individuals and they invested with them not to invest more in a specific year than what your taxable income is. And, and it absolutely made sense because think about it, you always had the opportunity to make that same investment in the next year. So if you, if you had a, a million um, taxable income this year, why invest two million? It doesn't make sense because just wait for the next year, you can delay your cash flow, make the investment the next year and get a deduction in the, in the following year. Now suddenly there's a deadline. There's a big stop street in the middle of, of our process. So in my thinking, I'm an investor, I wanna invest again, but I can't do it again. And that's what the deadline is, is causing. And, and the whole solution about this product, it's twofold. We, we looked at the, the, the various restrictions and we tried to do a, a funding option for these investors to enable them to maybe to put them in a position as if they were continuing to invest in 12J for the next three or four or five years. And that's, that's the beginning of the product. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail, but effectively what it means is um, on your screen, there's, there's three or four, three examples. The first one is a typical investor, let's call him John. John, um, if it wasn't for a restriction, John would have invested 200,000 a year for the next five years. He would have gotten a deduction every year for 200,000. Now suddenly John can't um, get a million deduction anymore, so he's limited to 200,000. The model is very simple. Um, let's take a view, let's, let's multiply John's investment or the 200,000 of available cash by five. Let's enable John to 5X his investment if you can go to the next slide, Alec, I can explain it in more detail. So the product is very simple. Remove the stop seat, enable the investor to, to 5X the current investment. Obviously, pending certain requirements. Um, it doesn't make sense to, to take an investment of five, five times your normal investment if you don't have a cash flow in the future to pay it. So you've got to look at your cash flow. Um, you are going to incur a loan, so we're going to assess your, your ability to generate cash in the future. But the concept is very simple now. So John, in that example, will invest 1 million rand worth future years capital as a Section 12J investment. Um, 200,000 will be payable in cash immediately before the end of June. And then 
four simple 200,000 payments in the next four, four years. So take your total investment, divide it by five, that's your monthly or that's your annual installment. So um, it is a loan, so the full shares are issued. The investor is 100% at risk, that loan needs to be repaid, there's no exception to that. And we will assess the ability of the investor to repay that loan. So that's very important for guys to understand. It's not a virtual product that you just um, issue a certificate. It's a factual loan. It's repayable within five years. And the investor is at risk to repay that loan in the future. Having said that, the typical client that would normally go ahead and invest 200000 a year, um, they have the ability to generate cash in the future. And it makes sense for them now to, to make a million investment and then match their cash flow in the future to the actual um, loan payments. So just to understand this a little better, they don't necessarily have to have a million rand in the bank today to make that investment. They can invest part of the million rand, so they've got 200,000 rand, but then borrow the other 800,000 rand with a, the sense in all of this being that you get the tax deduction on the full million rand, not just the 200 you're putting in today. That's the perfect summary, Alec. Um, that's exactly what it is. So you, you basically, if you, if you think about it, you get a tax deduction of five times the cash amount you put in now. now. Okay. And you fund There's the rest a, of it over the next five years. There are quite a few questions that have come through. Dudu wants to know, is there a minimum? Um, yes, yes, there is. So the minimum amount we can take is a, is a million in total. That means 200,000 per year. That's the minimum investment we can take as a VCC. Um, this is a private placement, so it's not a public offering to um, to the public. So, so we, there's a minimum of 200,000 per year, which adds up to a million over five years. Bruce's question is, is there any disadvantage from a tax perspective of using 12J in a trust? So perhaps I can uh, address that. The, um, there's no real disadvantage, but it's really the question is what it is that one wants to achieve. So of course, the, uh, the, the um, prevailing tax rates for trusts, like the top marginal rate for individuals, is presently at 45%. Uh, capital gains uh, effectively taxed at 36%, though, which is significantly higher for individuals. Uh, companies, again, their tax rate is 28%. But if one is going to get stuck with taxable income in a trust, and it is going to be taxed at 45% and, and there isn't going to be any distributions, it may make sense in that instance to rather than uh, say that we are going to be confronted with the, the taxable income and the tax and the trust, rather opt then for an investment in a Section 12J fund such as this to reduce that tax. And of course, that is not objectionable at all. These incentives are introduced exactly to confront taxpayers with this decision and to allow them to rather incent well rather to invest in the South African economy effectively than in the fiscus. Dudu's uh, come back with uh, another question. It's uh, just to add on to on the minimum investment amount over the five year period as a percentage of one's taxable income. Uh, so just give us an understanding uh, if you would on how you qualify for the tax benefit. In other words, what percentage of your taxable income should you be investing here uh, for an optimum result? Alec, I think with, with any investment, logic needs to prevail. So um, when you look at your investment, we normally recommend um, that you utilize that tax loss you're gonna create in at least either the first year, the second year or the third year. So it's more just to assist you on, on a cash flow matter. We normally don't recommend an investor to, to go longer than three years. So we wouldn't recommend more than 33% normally of your taxable income. But again, it's dependent on the individual. It's dependent on the ability of cash flow you're going to generate in the future. Um, some investors know they're going to sell a property in a year's time, um, or they know that there's other income coming in. So you've got to assess it on a case-by-case on -case basis. Um, but it's all about cash flow. And, and I think this is the... The mind shift, if I can say that, that the guys need to understand, it's all about cash. Um, how much can you afford to put down now? W what are you going to be able to afford um, paying in the next four years? And once you can answer that simple question is the second question is how much taxable income do I have to offset this investment again? And thirdly, just look at the underlying asset. Um, it, it's, it's probably the most important decision to make is whether you want to invest in a specific asset. And that's where I believe the, the key solar exchange fund is quite good. Because if you look at ESCOM, what's happening in South Africa and, and the fixed income nature of the fund, there's a predictable return. And the return is very important because you need the return from your investment to help you settle your interest. There's interest on the loan. Um, and I'll get to that details a bit later. 
Uh, there's a question here from Jacques uh, who says, how will the end of the tax incentive impact your business? Uh, and, well, the, the model of your business and continued investment from investors. I guess what he's asking is, will you be able to raise more capital and keep going next year? Doc, it's going to be much more difficult to raise capital. Let's be honest about it. There's no doubt about it. Um, but um, we, we're probably going to sit on close to 400 million at the end of, of June. So the objective from for us as future Nears is actually on rollout, on, in, on deploying that capital. Um, like I said at the beginning, we're all very operationally involved in the businesses. So there will definitely be a shift in futureness capital from capital raising into operational execution. Um, but like I said, it, it, we still have fund. Um, we still invest in a proper asset that can give you returns. So there are opportunities in the future to invest in, in similar assets. You'll just not have the tax break. Eddie's question is, what is the risk to the model of higher interest rates? Um, I'm not sure. So the interest rate model is you fund this this transaction. Um, we've we've negotiated a very low interest rate for the investor um, with a loan company which we own as well. So the interest rate on this transaction is prime less two percent, and then we take a one percent structuring fee. So effectively, there's a five percent interest rate plus a one percent. So the investor is effectively financing this transaction at below prime over the full five years. That's very important to note. So from that perspective, um, it's, in, it's prime linked. So when the interest rate goes up, there will be a slight increase in, in the interest payment, and it might have taken a bit longer before the investor will earn dividends. Um, because solar is a product that generates income over a long period of time, you need to for, um, make provision for increases in, in, in interest rates. But also what you need to bear in mind is um, as interest rates increase, all these solar projects are escalating at between 7.5% and 15%. So ESCOM is increasing their rates at 15%. We're concluding at least 7.5% with our clients. So there's a nice little above inflation escalation, which offset um, the probable increase in, his, in interest rates. Ivana wants to ask, and I'm sure Albertus, this is for you. Uh, is the carry forward of the tax loss only feasible under the five-year funding option, or can it work with a lump sum cash as well? No, so absolutely, it can work on, on a, for, for cash contributions now. So as Yaku alluded to earlier, 2.5 million for, for non-company investors and 5 million, of course, if you're a company. And that is if you uh, contribute all of your cash, the full subscription amount today, you get a deduction and which deduction is carried forward to the next year. If you're trading or if you receive um, uh, employment income, at least as an individual, and that is irrespective of whether you use this loan option or not. The loan option is simply now, I think, um, added to, to a number of, of VCC's uh, funding structure to say that let us help investors to place as much as possible in VCC's now. And in the result, even if it creates an assessed loss, to give assurance that that assessed loss will not be forfeited in years to come. Got it. Uh, will the this is from Gary uh, who asks: Will the investors' shareholding be calculated on the two hundred thousand? In other words, taking John's example that he puts in now, or on the one million rand? That's a simple one. It's on the. If I'm a it. it's it's on the one million, and I think uh, it's extremely important, Alec, to appreciate that you are subscribing for shares today at a million rand. That is a fact you are ever funding it to an extent with a deposit which may be requested and for the rest over the term of the loan but it's the same as going to borrow from the bank and to invest that cash in the vcc in this instance though the vcc and the borrower so happens to be the same person and it's not a, a particularly controversial scheme either section 12j subsection 3 specifically provides for the scenario and that is why all of these funding solutions have a five-year limit to it, is because Section 12J3 says the funding can be provided for up to five years, but no longer, then you're no longer deemed to be at risk, and the deduction in Section 12J2 is then no longer available. Okay, so it is an investment today that you're gearing up. Uh, if you were to take it in a, in a different sense, let's just say you wanted to buy lots of shares in a company uh, that 
somebody's emigrating and it's being offered for a very cheap a price, you've only got, it's going to cost a million rand, it, you've only got 200,000 rand, you would go to the bank or to a funder who would give you the other 800,000 rand, but you're paying the full million today, it's just that you've got 800,000 rand in, in a loan. What Where the advantage comes in in 12J is that you can write that full 1 million rand off against your taxable income. And if it exceeds this year's taxable income, you can take it into the next year. Is that accurate? Correct. Um, That's the a biggest, um, a good, a big advantage of this structure. Alec, let, let's take the middle example, a 2.5 million investment. So um, if you look at a 2.5 million investment, we're going to issue you with, with a share certificate and a 12J certificate of 2.5 million now at the end of June. You're only going to put in 500,000 in cash. That means if you submit your 2.5 million claim with SARS and you've got a taxable income already in this year of 2.5 million, you can claim back about 1.1 million on that claim already from SARS and that can effectively fund your next two years of payments as well. So it's all about the cash flow model and multiplying and using your tax upfront and you can use that tax benefit that you're gonna receive to actually fund your next two years of payments. Understood. Uh, Dudu's got another question. When is the overall investment declarable? Is it at the end of five years or immediately? When do you tell SARS about this? Immediately. So, you go ahead, Jakob. <laughs> go for the Albertus. Well, sure. So again, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I want to be very clear that you are subscribing for shares today of the total amount. So the investment is being made. So the full deduction is claimed now, and the full a declaration needs to be made to SARS, and you're entirely permitted to, to make that declaration to SARS. But it's very important that I think um, potential investors understand that it's not a commitment to invest in future. It's not to say that depending on factors, there will be cash flow that I'm making. There is a, an obligation that exists and that's brought into being by 30 June to invest. And I think it's important also to understand that if this VCC were to fold or any other one in which one invests, the investor is still obligated to service the loan. So it's not dependent on a tax refund or anything. It is a proper loan coming into place, which needs to be serviced come hell or high water. But if there's a real loan, a full subscription taking place, in other words, on 30 June, even though funded or fully geared, that deduction can be claimed immediately because there is expenditure actually incurred, albeit funded in future by the end of this tax year. Now you got or me worried, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are worried as well. Uh, but when you say if the investment, if the company that you invest in goes bust, Yaka, please tell me that's not going to happen here. <laughs> what are the risks of the risks of that occurring? I'm going to run away. Huh? <laughs> now, if you look at the investment, um, like I said, we've got 400 million on our balance sheet at the moment. We, we're well invested. If you look at the balance sheet of, of Future Nears Capital, um, there's lots of assets exceeding liabilities. And very important, if you read our MOI, our Memorandum of Incorporation, we as a, as a VCC, we're actually not allowed to incur any liabilities in, in a VCC. So the VCC effectively can only take capital and make investments. And that's very important to protect an investor. Um, the trading companies, obviously, that money flows down into a trading company. If the trading company is not successful, obviously, you can lose your, your money. It's like any other investment, um, even, even big banks fault. I mean, in 2008, a few guys lost millions by having their money in the bank. This thing is different because you've got a real asset protecting your investment, being solar assets. And more importantly, you've got a 25-year contract in place. And that contract is backed by an agreement. And you're selling to 10 different clients. So the chances of that, of four or five of that clients going bankrupt and you're not collecting and you're not replacing those tenants with other tenants in the buildings are extremely slim, Alex. So from that perspective, um, solar projects are probably one of your lower, uh, apart from property, it's one of your, your lowest risk investments. And the benefit of it, it gives you decent returns at a very, very low risk. So if I may clarify, perhaps, and it's, it's simply to say that you are at no lesser risk than anyone else would be who invests cash. In any other VCC or in fact in any other venture in this country, if the underlying assets go bust and the company goes bust, there is no recovery of your hard-earned cash that you've invested. But that is the nature of any equity investment. And all I'm saying is that exactly the same applies 
to debt financing and debt-based investment, which one is entering to, into here. So very so important you borrowed, is, If you sorry, borrowed uh, a million rand to buy Steinhoff shares, uh, you'd be feeling it now because you still have to repay the debt, as happened to a lot of the people who work for Steinhoff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just, okay. just on the loan, I think if we go to the next page, um, there's, you'll see that there's a lot of finance options in the market available. So the way your loan is structured is essential in this case, because like Alberta said, it's all about the loan. The loan needs to be simple. You need to understand how it works and you need to be able to repay it. Um, the interest rate is very, very important on these loans. So the way we've structured our loan is a, is a five, 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 five model. Um, so we want to give you five more years of, of 12J, but like I say, think cash. If you can't afford it, don't go for it. Then you, you might just get a, a two by two by two model type of scenario. Um, so look at your cash flows. Think what you can afford over the next few years, taking into account your tax break that you're going to receive from sales as well. Um, are you going to pay for it? Five equal payments. And then we apply a very low interest rate of 5%. And the difference here is that 5% is applied over the full five years. It's not a bridging for just up to February next year. And so that 5% is payable throughout the five years that you have to repay the loan. Now, so the first question that remains then, so if there's no monthly payments and I'm only gonna make an annual payment, what's gonna happen with the interest? So the simple answer is the dividends from your investment. And that's why it's so important that we're gonna generate profits and that you're investing in an asset that's gonna give you predictable returns and yields, which is the solar fund, because there's, there's contracted revenue coming in. That dividends from that fund is going to be declared to you as an investor. We as a VCC will pay over withholding tax on your behalf to source and, and the net amount will be offset against your interest. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a model that generates revenue for you to settle your interest. From a cash flow perspective, you just pay your bulk payments every year. And, and if the model works the way we predict it's going to work from year four onwards, you'll be cash positive and you'll be starting receiving dividends that's going to exceed the interest. So let me understand this. Is it a fixed interest rate then for the five years when you say you pay 5% over the five-year term? It, let me just clarify. It's prime less 2% and then there's a 1% um, structuring fee from our side as well. So, so work on prime less one as your effective cost of funding over the five years. Okay, but it is if prime goes up, I think that's the big question. Let's just say that oh, something crazy yeah. happens and prime doubles. You've got to pay yeah. higher interest? Absolutely. That's unfortunately the, the nature of the beast. Um, the, the, the loan is linked to, to, to Prime. Remember, we as a loan company, we also borrowed money. The same is going to happen to us. Um, I think what's important is, and somebody asked that question earlier, is how we, do we actually mitigate the risk of interest rates? And that's your increase on, on, on your, your power purchase agreement. So our, our income effectively increases at at least 7.5% per year. And that should offset... Um, potential increases in, in interest rate. And, and I think to be realistic, all of us should be expecting interest rates to, rate, um, to increase slightly over the next few years. It's not gonna stay at, at the rates that's currently in place, um, but government will be responsible hopefully and, and, and increase it slightly because the economic, we've got to stimulate economic growth. So we do foresee interest rates staying low for at least another two years. Rowan's question, hey, yo, we've got a lot of questions to get through and I know we've also got a presentation to get through, but we'll, we'll try and balance between the two. Rowan's question is, and by the way, when you pose your questions, thank you for putting your surnames. Don't worry, I'm not going to disclose your surname. Just in case somebody in, uh, in a building in Pretoria is listening and wants some information on you. So they'll have to go and dig elsewhere and look at all the Rowans if they want to try and find out who you are. So uh, not to worry about your anonymity will be retained. Rowan says, can this be used to manage capital gains tax? And is the inclusion amount the investment required? Uh, summarize how it works, please. So, um, sure. So you'll know, uh, like that. I mean, government has been on record for a number of years that it wants to increase the capital gains tax inclusion rate from the 40% and the 80% where it is presently for individuals and for companies and trusts to 50% and 100% as we have in, in in most other jurisdictions in the world. So we are steadily going in that in that direction. Rowan's question is, is entirely accurate, and, and I think he, he understands the answer, is to say that if I've earned a million rands worth of capital gains in the year, and I'm going to, as an individual, therefore, have taxable income of 400,000 rand, how much do I need to invest to have effectively the full capital gain uh, reduced in this year, in other words, to pay no tax? 
And the answer is 400,000 Rand. That's the taxable income. So that's what you want the deduction against. So that's the first point. The second is whether the 12J deduction could work for it. And yes, absolutely it can. So your deduction is available as it would be against other income, similarly against your included taxable gains too. Whether you can create an assessed loss is perhaps a different question. If an individual only earns capital gains year on year, for example, someone who's retired, has no other income, and starts selling off shares year on year, that individual can claim the deduction. However, he or she will not be trading, and therefore any assessed losses created will be forfeited in the year thereafter. If, however, a salaried individual or a trading individual or a trading company were to realize a capital gain, yes, the deduction can be utilized not only against that gain, but to the extent that it creates a loss can also be carried over to the next year of assessment. Okay, well put. Uh, Chris's question uh, is, what is the interest rate on the loans being offered? I think you've answered that three times already now, Yako, but do you want to answer it a fourth time? Okay, work on 6% for now, Chris. That's prime minus 1%, um, but it's prime link. It's a link to prime. Prime goes up. Uh, it uh, You'd have prime minus 2 plus the 1% uh, that the company Lock. takes. I think the one thing we've got to, from an economic perspective, um, if interest rates goes up, um, hopefully we can we can increase the interest um, the escalations on the contracts as well. So we're spending a lot of time on interest rates, but I think it's very important to finance this transaction at a at a below prime interest rate. I wouldn't recommend guys going to, to the bank and and borrowing at, at very expensive interest rates. Um, a second point I want to make on this: there's no personal sureties on this loan, um, so the rate you're getting for a for a loan with, with, with limited sureties and, and assets from your own personal balance sheet to be given a security it is actually quite quite um, astounding. And then the only security we take on that loan is the, your shares. And, and the reason for that is we believe in the asset. Um, so if you're going to default, we're obviously going to go through a default process. That's, that's actually prescribed by the National Credit Act. We're going to enable you to sell those shares in the market. Um, as for anything, and and if that doesn't happen, we're going to try to purchase those those shares, and and you might lose on that, and and that's that's what the, the point that Albertus will make as well. Um, you're probably not going to lose everything because they they still value those shares, but um, you've got limited tradability in a 12J. It's not a listed share, and that that's the case with any any 12J. Um, so when you trade your shares, there's a limited market that's willing to buy the shares, and you will probably lose in selling that. So the intention um, when you make this investment, you, you need to be in it for five years and, and you need to take a view that, that you're going to be able to service your loan. Uh, there's a question from Ridwan, which I think is a quite an easy answer. He asks, can you use a 12J retrogressively? In other words, put it into your 28, 12, 2021 tax return. Albertus? Yeah, so the question is, the deduction becomes available when you incur expenditure. As we said, you can incur expenditure in entering into a loan too. But the short answer is, of course, then if I ex incur expenditure today, I cannot claim it on the basis that I've, I've, I've incurred it yesterday. Factually, that's not the case. So there isn't a retrogressive um, claim available, unfortunately. Dries Which is asks, why it's yeah. so very, very important to invest by 30 June. Entering into a loan agreement or placing a cash investment after 30 June, then the 12 year tenure of this incentive would have been finally lapsed and, and it's, there's unfortunately no further opportunity to utilize it. It's a very important point, just in case anybody has forgotten. It ends at the 30th of June. It's over, no more. You come on the 1st of July, uh, Yako is gonna say, Yammer. Uh, Albert is going to say, I can't do anything for you to get your, your tax uh, deduction. No matter how you try, it's over. It's closed off. So you've you got you to gotta, vickle. Gotta I mean, there's only, what's it now? We're on the 8th already. Uh, yeah. June has got 30 days. So it's 22 days to go. Uh, how long does it take for you to put the loan agreement together? Yeah, that, that's a good point, Alec. Um, people need to realize there's a, it's a bit more complicated investing through this loan structure. Uh, you've got to apply for a loan. There's a proper loan assessment that needs to take place. Luckily, we're not a big bank. We're not a corporate, so we do it quite quickly. But I, I would say you need at least three to four days to just go through the process. From applying it, you'll have to submit um, income statement balance sheet, a pay slip, 
it's a normal loan assessment process that takes place. So please, please, guys, don't leave it for the last week. We experience it every year. Um, so if you want to make use um, for the product, get your applications in, um, get your answers or your questions answered. It does take a while. Yeah, if you get into the last week, you're going to have to do a cash payment, essentially, because it's going to be very, very difficult for you to do a credit assessment in, in a few days. Absolutely. And, and, and the market is just crazy this year, Alec, as well. So, um, and, I, and I think it goes back to what, we, what we've said, and that's the purpose of this thing. The market wants to continue investing in 12J, and that's exactly what this product does. The product gives you the opportunity to structure your investment in such a way um, that, that you would continue investing for the next few years. And and we can help you do it. It's as simple as that. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail, don't they? Uh, Driss, That's let's get to what he was what he was saying a moment ago. He says, uh, his question is, will it make sense for a company to invest with two VCCs, in other words, two companies, uh, 12J qualifying companies, in order to diversify your investment uh, to different products? If okay. they both sound investments, absolutely. Uh, I mean, if, you, if, if, your, if your investment strategy is diversification, yes, it makes sense. Just remember that the 5 million um, limitation still remains in place. So you can only put 2.5 million and 2.5 million. I'm not sure. Am I correct on that, Albertus? So, so that's the limitation. You can't now suddenly go invest 5 million with one VCC and a 5 million with another VCC. So that your limitation applies across all VCCs. Um, like I said, there's, there's lots of, um, of our investors that invest in different products as well. Um, so it depends on your investment strategy. If you like di diversification, yes. Um, if you don't and you believe in one asset and that asset gives you the most security, I would recommend you, you back that one asset. I'm a, I'm a one horse person, so I, I back the right horse. So when you go to the July, you're going to go with, uh, with a single number one or number seven or whatever it is. It's, you're not going to spread <laughs> across the field. Mm. Uh, Red One's question was, is there a monthly income paid back to investors? That one um, depends on the cash order or the loan model. So, so there's no monthly payments. Um, dividends are paid on an annual basis. So if you invest in cash, you're going to receive an annual dividend. If you're investing um, through the loan product, the first few years, we will declare dividends to you, but all of those dividends will be used to offset against the interest. So you'll probably only receive cash in your pocket from year four onwards on the dividends. That's on the loan product. On the cash model, you'll, you'll immediately start receiving dividends from year, year, year one onwards. Bruce's question it's a, is, it's, uh, not it's not a monthly income. Bruce's question is for clarity. Uh, he says, so a company or a trust has to invest a minimum of 5 million Rand. Is that correct? No, it's, it's actually um, the maximum for a company is 5 million and the maximum for a trust is 2.5 million. I think what okay. said minimum is because of the Companies Act requirement um, to ensure that it's not a, a public offering. Um, the requirement is a minimum investment of 1 million Rand. But I think what he's saying is that you can get a deduction of up to 2.5 million for trusts and individuals or 5 million for companies. Okay, yeah. so there's a maximum and a minimum, uh, and it's between 1 and, in this case, and 2.5 uh, million for individuals or up to 5 million for a company. Ivan is back with another question. If I make another Section 12J investment which doesn't have the carry forward on the tax loss, as well as the KSE one in this tax year, will SARS treat it correctly, i.e. provide tax refund on the non-KSE investment and allow the carry forward on the KSE one? Good question, Albertus. So SARS will treat it correctly, but unfortunately in exactly the opposite manner. So what happens is that you can only claim as an individual a deduction of 2.5 million rand, be it for subscriptions on loan or cash. It's for VCC subscriptions. So if it's a cash investment, you can have a 2.5 million. If you do another 2.5 million investment on loan, it stays only unfortunately 2.5 million for this year, meaning the, the carry forward can at most be 2.5 million. But the likelihood is that it in any event will be at least significantly absorbed in this year with only a slightly uh, or only a bit left as a carry forward for the next year. So it's, it's not an additional investment that you're qualifying for by virtue of entering into the loan structured product. Lawrence's question is, is it classified as trading to allow the assessed loss to be carried forward? And if it is classified as trading, 
then will the trust be classified as trading so that Section 7C won't apply? Albertus? So there are a number of, of matters from that question. The first is that because you're carrying forward the loss, doesn't mean that you are there for trading. Rather, trading is a requirement for you to be able to carry forward the assessed loss. So one isn't deemed to be trading as a result of carrying forward these assessed losses. So that's the first point. The second is, if a trust claims an, a, a deduction and it would by chance also be trading by virtue of the other activities that it is involved in, then yes, an assessed loss, which it creates through the deduction, may be carried forward to the next year of assessment. Section 7C, unfortunately, is unaffected by this old regime. Section 7C, Alec, I'm not sure whether you recall, is a, is a rather new provision in the Income Tax Act. Well, I say new, it's been introduced in 2017, to target interest-free loans by individuals or their companies to trusts, effectively. And that gives rise to a donations tax to the uh, consequence, to the extent that interest is in charge on that loan from an individual to his or her trust. And that donations tax consequence is unfortunately part of a, of a separate regime. It doesn't create an income tax cost, and therefore the income tax deduction provided by Section 12J doesn't impact on any such an obligation. I, I, I really uh, no, we're never going to get through all the questions. There are just so many, but uh, in the hour that we've allowed. But before we we spend the rest of the time answering questions, there is one more slide that's worth talking to. Do you guys want to pick up on this? It might answer, in fact, uh, some of the questions being posed. Okay. So, Alec, um, I've basically just explained the cash flow to an investor um, on the screen. So, if, if you will see, this is an example of the five-year payment plan for uh, an individual investor that's going to invest 2.5 million now. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that person would be able to utilize the full tax loss over the next two years. So half of the 2.5 million are going to be utilized in year one, in this next tax year ending the end of Feb 2022. And then the investor is going to be able to create a tax loss and carry forward that tax loss because they're trading into year two and the remaining 50% portion will be utilized in the next year. So if you look at the top line, which is the green line there, that's your cash flow. And that's probably the most important line there. This investor will invest 500,000 in year one, 500,000 in year two, and so forth over the four years. Simple calculation, 2.5 million divided by five, that's your annual installment. Based on that, we're going to issue a share certificate. You're subscribing for the full 2.5 million, like Al Albert has explained up front. And based on the 2.5 million, you can claim against your taxable income a 2.5 million deduction. Um, like I said, the assumption in this example is that you're going, to, you're going to split it over two years. So the benefit in year one might be 542,000. I can't see that it's so small. 400. 562,000. 562,500. Mm -hmm. Maps are um, aren't that sharp today. Anyway, that that benefit on our split over two years. So you'll utilize a portion of it year one and a portion of it year, in year two. Now, what's important to understand that can already fund your next year contribution because the tax benefit in that year is is more than your your total contribution. So, very important when you look at your cash flow, work out when you're going to utilize your tax loss and when that cash flow is going to become available. So, that's that's the top line. That's that's what you're going to pay um, as an investor. So, what happens um, in the middle? In the, in the middle is now we now we're taking that money and we're investing it. So, I've just lost your. On the slide uh, that was my apologies. Uh, uh, it's no a worries. user error, but we're back. Mm -hmm. So effectively, what's going to happen now is we're going to invest that money and we're going to generate dividends for you. So in year one, it might take a while for us to roll out that dividends. We're going to pay you, in that example, 70,000 of dividends. There's going to be a withholding tax applicable of 14,000 and 56,000 are going to be re remained um, after we've deducted the, the dividends tax and we're going to offset that against your interest. The same happens in year two. You're going to have a dividend of 96,000, less dividends withholding tax, and the 70 to 70,000 will be offset against your interest. That's now the, the five or six percent I referred to previously. And then you'll see from year four onwards, you're going to start receiving dividends because now your, your cash flow positive, your loan has been repaid in full, and now you start getting dividends paid to you directly 26,000 in year four, and another 133,000 in year five. Um, the nice part of this investment structure then is at the end of five years, it's our target to return the full 2.5 million to you. So not the, only the 500,000 you put in initially, 
the full 2.5 million, less our upfront fee, which is 5%, and then less any capital gains tax. So at that point of time, if you exit the structure, the base cost of your investment will be zero. So there is a capital gains tax payable. If you remain in the structure, you will have an option to, to remain invested and continue earning dividends. That's, that's an option. Um, but you will then receive a net cash flow of 2 million. And if you look at your cash flow at the bottom, this gives you an, an effective return, an annual return on your investment of 26% before tax and 17% post tax. And it all depends on how quickly you utilize your tax loss. So if you utilize the full tax loss in year one, that return will, will, will go up. If you utilize it a bit slowly, maybe going to year three and four, that would go down a bit. Also very important, and that's probably something that most of the people miss in this model is you, you've got five times more liquidity in this investment. Um, probably the main restriction for any 12-J investment is, is liquidity because you've got to be in there for five years. You can't really trade your investment in a five year. Mm. This model effectively, your first 500,000 is in it for five years. Your second 500,000 is in it for another four years and so forth. But remember, there's still a liability. Yeah and so forth. But so there's a bit more liquidity on it. You've still, you've still got to be able to service the loan and the full transaction was done in the first year, but it gives you a bit of flexibility um, to manage your cash flow in, in a better manner. The last 500,000, like you said, you'll get it back quicker than, than the five year period. Um, when you add it all up together, um, what, what, the pro what the product is designed to give you is an opportunity to assess your individual circumstances. Um, and I think this is where it's different. It's specifically been designed there's other funding or solutions in the market where this is your investment amount. Let's work out how to fund it. This model works differently. This, is, this, is what, this was your initial thinking. I was only going to invest a million. Now suddenly 2.5 million makes sense. So this is a way to increase that investment amount, obviously with incense, and you've got to be able to service the loan, and, and your cash flow is essential. But it's, an, it's a way to 5x your, your ability to deduct, and then we help you to cash flow the, the transaction over the next five years. All right. I, I'm sure that uh, many of the people uh, who are listening in are thinking, damn it, I'm not going to be able to have my question answered. So what I'm going to suggest, Jaco, is that we pick up all the questions, get them to you. And if you wouldn't mind uh, emailing people individually so that they don't feel like they've wasted their time by asking their individual questions. And then the second thing is what you've just gone through now, I think is quite, it's fairly complex. But if you're watching the video with a, uh, a notepad and a pencil next to it, there's no doubt that you'll be able to come. Uh, I, I think you've explained it very well, but it might just take a little while to get through that. I'm going to ask one more question because we've pretty much run out of time. And that's from Dion. Uh, he says, what happens if an investor passes away? Well, Marcus, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So from a tax perspective, you get your deduction in the year of assessment in which you've uh, applied for it or, or claimed it at least. So let's say you make the investment on, on 30 June 2021 and our uh, unlucky investor uh, passes away on, on the 1st of July 2021. Uh, the fact of the matter is that your tax year then ends. It's deemed to end if in the same year it's on that day. So 1 July and you have a tax deduction and uh, you can claim it against your income. Fact of the matter is there won't be any income in future. So while there is an assessed loss, it won't be set off against any income that will be created thereafter because simply there's no income to be created. What happens though at death is that there is also a deemed disposal of all of one's assets at that stage at market value. So it typically triggers a, a quite a significant uh, tax charge. So we have an exit charge when you uh, immigrate, you also have a tax charge when you immigrate um, to the, uh, as we say, Kansta Hirna Mals. So we well, die. Uh, can you, hopefully it's upstairs, not downstairs. Well, up or down, but yes, um, immigrate to not sideways, but uh, vertically. Um, and that capital gain is then also, of course, um, capable of being set off against the assessed loss or the deduction that one has created through uh, the uh, Section 12J investment. Albertus, Jaco, thank you for that very informative and innovative, uh, even though Albertus, you said it's not controversial and it's nothing new, but I think for a lot of us, it, it is new and it is a, it's opened uh, quite a few uh, windows of opportunity for people who might have not been thinking along these lines. Uh, as promised, 
uh, I will be giving all the, or well, it won't be me, probably be Clive, will send through all of the questions and there must be mm, probably another dozen uh, that haven't been answered. They will go, will go to Yako and he's uh, endeavored to get back to you on those. And of course, the video will be available on YouTube a little later this afternoon. I know Stuart prides himself on getting it up in a couple of hours. And now that Dudu's taken over, well, she'll probably make it in an hour. So that's it for us for today. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to being back in your company for the next 12J webinar. Uh, it is coming to an end soon. I would once again stress, if you want to take advantage of this opportunity, please don't tarry. Until the next time, cheerio. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio.